But at the same time, I would always read labels and I didn't want to eat things that had a lot of chemicals. Like, so I got down to the point where I mean, I was re reading the labels and to this day, it's like, I can't even find a bar that I want to eat anymore. They're all full of stuff that I can't eat. It's Most so things have weight. I'm sensitive to weight. I can't eat those. I don't want to eat all that junk. And then, you know, even the chalk zero stuff that says it's low carb is keto. That's not, not going to help you lose the weight. And so just eat real food. You can get cacao paste. You can mix that with coconut butter. You could spread it out on a pan and make your own chocolate. You could add whatever sweetener you want to it. And so it becomes a cleaner version of things that you could eat keto. So it's not that cocoa is bad for you. It's what they put in it. And so if you're buying all your stuff from the store and it's full of chemicals, I mean, when I run food sensitivity test, it has a chemical. It tests foods and chemicals. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and you're going to love today's episode, especially if you're a woman over 50 who has been struggling to lose weight. My guest today is Lori Ballou. She's an ADAPT certified functional health coach and certified functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner who is helping women over 50 lose weight for good to reclaim the second half of their life so they can live a pain-free, active lifestyle. She's on a mission to empower and inspire women to choose health as their wealth over being stuck, sick, and overweight as they age. After losing 100 pounds, reversing prediabetes, ditching asthma, allergies, and depression, she also naturally repaired degenerating knees. With all her functional health knowledge and lived experience, she developed her signature holistic low-carb method for women over 50 to age beautifully and adventurously. Lori, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really excited to kind of just take a peek under the hood and reveal what it really took for you to lose that 100 pounds, to keep it off, to reverse your prediabetes, and to just share the importance of gut health and a low-carb lifestyle so thank you for coming on. I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited. I love being able to just uh, tell my story and empower women and let them know that, you know, never give up on your goals, never give up on your vision, because if you just keep going and looking for your weight loss solution, you will even end up finding it because, you know, you know, there was a quote that I heard recently that said that um, fear kills more dreams than actually starting than failure. So if you if you have fear, but you don't push into the fear, you will always have failure. But if you get into action, even though you push through the fear, there's never failure because you're yeah. making action changes and you're going to get some results. And then as you get over the fear and you keep moving through it, you figure out what it is that you need to do next. And that's just what we got to do. We just got to keep the action plans going. Absolutely. Yep. I like to say there's no failure after go. Like everything mm -hmm. there is just learning. So start with your story. You know, did you always have a weight problem or did your weight creep up over age? Like kind of just start from the beginning for us. Yeah, I used to have a, a weight problem even as a child. Out of one out of seven children, I was the only one that was overweight. And I did reach up to 200 pounds at one point and I had severe depression. So I've noticed over the years is every time I put on weight, I have more depression. And so this, like you were saying, this is a gut dysfunction too, which I didn't know, of course, at the time, because I was just a kid struggling. But every time my gut would get out of shape and I had food sensitivities, looking back, I would just end up with more depression. And so that can be really hard to manage because even if you go on a diet and you lose the weight, if you haven't corrected your gut health, you may still have a problem, but that's definitely something to focus on. And that was what my mom did for me when I was um, young, because I started gaining weight either fifth, between fifth and seventh grade. And she put me on the Atkins diet. She used to read Adele Davis. So she knew that that she could figure out things, figure out what vitamins to put my brothers on because they were hyperactive. And so they became hyperactive. I'm the one that became obese. And we ate all the processed food. We ate ice cream. We had donuts. We had, I remember the animal cookies. Those were things that were just oh, like yeah. so much fun to eat. Yet I just reacted more, you know, I just, I'm the one that had huge food sensitivities. And I remember back all the time, because one of the things you have that happens with the food sensitivity is you have th your throat clears. So you're always clearing your throat. So I had a dairy sensitivity from the very beginning. And so that was one of the things I think that just kept me having gut dysfunction. 
And when you have gut dysfunction again, that's when you get that leaky brain, the depression more. And that's really cool is they're they're actually noticing that. And there's a a psychiatrist, Harvard trained doctor. I don't know if you've heard of Chris Palmer. I mean, you probably have. He's doing amazing things with low carb diets and keto diets to actually help reverse depression, yeah. reverse bipolar, and also schizophrenia with a ketogenic diet. And so that's, you know, that's why when my mom put me on the Atkins back when I was a kid, it reset my metabolism. So I was able to get 50 pounds down, kind of stabilize at 150 through high school, because that's the weight I remember being at. And then I would just be on that merry go round of diets, trying everything to lose the weight. And it was the Jenny Craig, it was Nutrisystem, and it was low calorie, but I never had energy to exercise. I never really felt like I have full power. I think that might've been it is I, I didn't, I don't ever recall exercising, <laughs> you know, so it, it must not have happened. That's something that's my passion now, because now I have more energy and I can able to turn that into getting more movement to really kind of f- come full circle to get that weight loss, that, which is what helps you lose and keep the weight off long-term. So yeah, it started as a child and, um, it, it, um, was in my mid thirties that I, was at my highest weight. And the story that I like to start with that uh, my official weight loss journey that started was because I walked in from an an outing with my eight-year-old son at the time, and this was in the 90s. And my husband was sitting on the sofa. I walk in, he doesn't even look at me. He just asked me this question, when am I gonna lose the weight? Well, at that point, I guess now. So that was when Susan Powder was huge. And all you had to do was cut out all the fat can, yeah. And you can still eat sugar and you can lose the weight, supposedly. And actually, I exercised. So I became aware of what I was eating and I had a spur and I had a goal and I wanted to lose the weight. And so I did lose weight. I had PCOS. I was infertile. I dropped about 50 or 60 pounds doing that process. But it, as soon as I got pregnant and I had the baby, the weight all came back. And so every time I would stop dieting, I would gain the weight. So I came, I kind of coined this term as if I wasn't dieting, I was gaining weight. And so it was always using the willpower, always trying to diet and living on diets. And you know, what woman isn't living on a diet? You're always trying to figure out how am I going to lose this weight? And then we think it's willpower and we're using our willpower, but willpower is, you know, never works long term because it's not a calories in calories out problem. It's a hormonal problem. So if you don't fix the root cause, we can struggle and we can force our body to lose the weight, but we're not necessarily, um, we might be losing muscle and bone. We're not necessarily only using losing the fat. And so if you're losing weight, but don't feel healthy, then there's still a problem. And so what I discovered was I started studying ancestral health and ancestral nutrition. I started looking at paleo diets. And every time I would read or experiment with supplementations and I would feel better, I could see that there is a process. There is food can be like your medicine if you could dial in the right diet for your body. And so I was looking for that solution. I didn't know what it was. I didn't realize I had a, um, food sensitivities at the time. And as long as I kept wheat in my diet, kept sugar in my diet, I just could not succeed. I would still have that anxiety. I would still have that depression. I would still have the prediabetes. And so at one point, well, with a really cool turnaround point was I did HCG. I worked in a natural food store. So I was like a vitamin supplement a consultant. I was focused on essential oils. I was focused on a specialty foods. But at that time, it was the raw food movement. It was still, yeah. you know, honey's fine, maple syrup, honey. At that time, it was agave was okay. As long as you didn't eat processed food, you know, you were healthy. But it still didn't work for me. What really did work was the HCG because you go, but it's a starvation diet. I mean, you're tricking your body into thinking you're starving and it's using the pregnancy hormone as homeopathic drops. And so you do, you know, you eat 500 calories a day, you don't eat any fat, and then your body will just get into a survival mechanism where you will actually burn the fat. But the same thing is if you, once you start bringing back the sugar and the wheat, you flip that metabolic switch back on, you flip your sugar switch on. And your fat, your fat just boomerangs back. And so it was frustrating. It was overwhelming. And I never could keep the weight off at that point. And so here I am approaching 53. I tried that. But what that did for my brain, what that made it kind of like a, a put, I like to say I, I, I glean more 
information and I put this puzzle together in my brain. And so I'm coming up with, I get this, these pieces of information in my brain and all of a sudden they start connecting. And so I was reading, cause I told you I was, I was also the book. I was also the book um, orderer at this, at this natural food store. So I would order all the books that I wanted to read and then I would read them and I would sell them to the customers and I would get excited about it. And so the thing is, I always got excited. And so every time I got more information, I would just run with it. And so when I read William Davis's The Wheat Belly Book, that clicked. That's made the switch. I'm like, oh my God, I was, you know, I had gone off wheat for the most part, but I could not get rid of like the bakery breads at this, at the restaurants and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so once I read his book, I'm like, oh my God, I'm never going to eat wheat again. And so that was pivotal. And so then I was transitioning more into paleo. And so I was able to take the wheat out, but I still haven't taken the sugar out. So for me, it still was, I had too much, my blood sugar was still too elevated. And so it's not that sugar or fruit are completely bad for people. It's that depends on whether you have insulin resistance. I've had insulin resistance off and on my whole life, and it was then affecting me in my brain, and it created that depression. And so it was a paleo nutrition that was educating me, and all the books were saying, yes, this is, will work. But I'm like, but it's not yet working for me, so what more do I need to do? Right. And so we got down to the point where I'm just eating, you know, goji berries, golden berries, and um, mulberries, all of the stuff I studied. This is all good, healthy antioxidants. You know, this is good stuff for the body. This is paleo, right? But I would nibble all the time. I would have trail mix. I would eat that. That would be my kind of my, kept my sugar switch turned on. My eyes were wonky. I kept rubbing my eyes. I couldn't see straight. My hair was thinning. I was about 52, 53 at this point. And then I found out about that Bulletproof Conference because, again, working at the natural food store, I had information about the books, the diets, and I went to the conference. And I listened to a brain scientist. He was a 10-year brain cancer survivor, and he was a body type scientist. And I asked him a question afterwards, and um, he just took one look at me and said, don't eat fruit. So I'm like, okay, well, here's somebody who's a 10-year brain cancer survivor, and I'm going to do what he says. I've been empowered. I've been listening to all the stuff at that conference, and that was more information in my brain. And I'm like, okay, that very day I went keto. I switched to Bulletproof Coffee. I started adding in the fat and the protein, and yeah. I've been doing coconut milk all along. And so that's been a very powerful um, coconut milk and coconut oil along has been something that I started adding to my diet. And so this was not something I considered restrictive at all. This was an opportunity for me to fine tune what I needed to do to feel better. And so immediately I dropped 20 pounds. My brain turned back on. My vision cleared, which I didn't even know was bad because it, I didn't know until it was better. <laughs> And that's when I got excited. I got excited to start studying the ADAPT functional health coaching program. And I could, I would tell everybody at the store, I'm like, oh, you should do this. You should do this. This is so exciting. And then when I, it took me a year to do that, there's a lot of growth, a lot of tears, a lot of growing because I had to change my whole nervous system had to change. And so that was a really good process for me. And then I was like, well, this is great, but functional diagnostic nutrition, I could do so much more with that. And so I did all this weekends and, and evenings while working full time and raising my children. And I was just like, you know, my children had to go through all the changes. I kept making all the changes. Yeah. Even when my oldest son was young, I, I remember putting him on soy milk, taking him off dairy, doing the Susan powder thing, you know, trying to do that for him as well. And so I've always been somebody who would just get excited about making those changes, you know, following something that what if this would work for me and let's just make these action plans. So I was always in action, I think. Once yeah. that, you know, once I realized that I could make a change and that there is a solution out there and I just had to find it, I was just ready to look. I was looking. I was yeah. looking. And I just stayed excited. And I think being a reader, my mom taught me how to read. She showed me that you know, we could get into books and we can look things up and we could collect things. So there's so many good books. I started reading Why We Get Fat. And, you know, again, Dr. William Davis, his book on the wheat belly, once I learned that, never went back to the wheat, but I just had to get off the sugar too. The sugar was too much for my body. And I like to let people know, it's just like, it's not that fruit is bad for you. It's if it's in moderation, but do, do you have insulin resistance? It's like, it's like pouring fuel on a fire. If you're putting more fuel on a fire that needs to be banked down and, and corrected or turned off, 
that, you know, if you have insulin resistance, it's the same thing. Your sugar switch is turned on. You can't have a lot of sugar on that if you're elevated with your blood sugar regulation. And so that was the one thing that needed to be turned off. So I call that flipping the sugar switch off so you could tap into fat burning and then that can correct your metabolism. Mm-hmm. And so there's so many things we can do when we get to that point. And does it have to be forever? Well, that kind of depends on how everybody feels. But when you're in your 50s and you're low on estrogen and you're insulin resistant more so in, the, in your 50s, the best way to get this all under control is to actually you know, ha- create a low carb lifestyle. But basically, when you look at a low carb lifestyle, what you're doing is you're taking out processed foods, you're taking out the refined sugars, you're taking out the refined grains. If it's the grains and the sugars that are causing us to be dysfunctional, get excited and get the knowledge and know that, you know, get your vision. Like, what do you want to look like in five years or even a year? If you can change your body and get your health back so that you can go out and be active and you lose all the weight, lose all the weight. I, you know, I didn't even know I could lose this much weight. I was, mm-hmm. I was 59 when I'm like, you know what? You're only like 10 pounds away from a hundred pounds. Let's do this. And so all of a sudden I, it just came off really easily. And, but it was, but it was like you said in the beginning, like I had to, I had to dial in gut health. Cause when I lost the 20 pounds, that was it. I, I did stalled for three years. And so I like to tell people, don't worry about a plateau. Even if you have a plateau, you are still not gaining the weight back. What can you do next? How can you biohack your biology and what, you know, switch things up, do some extra fasting, change your food around. We always want to eat within a circadian our circadian balance. And so we want to do time restricted eating, but eat within daylight hours. There has been studies that show if you just eat within daylight hours and you could actually reverse prediabetes just by eating within a daylight hour. Some people have done that. And the, and the Sacha Panda talks about his mom coming over and visiting from India. And that was her problem. She had her window, food window open from six in the morning till like 11 o'clock at night. Well, as you just close the window at six, you know, six to six, you eat within the 12 hour window and then maybe close that up depending on what you need to do. As long as you keep the processed food out too, that's, that's, that's just so empowering to be able to make the changes. Yeah. Well, I have so many great follow-up questions. I think just to kind of reflect back in case people are wondering like, okay, well, what, what were the things that made the difference? I think you're always in action. You're always, mm-hmm. you're always in action. You never lose hope. I think is kind of the recurring theme there. And then, but I, I have a couple questions. Because people may not be familiar with what paleo even means. So you said you kind of switched from the low calorie, low fat diet to a paleo diet. And will you just explain to people what is a paleo diet? And then you said you went from paleo to keto. So I think just to kind of tease out some of the language that they may not be familiar with. Yeah. So paleo diet is what they're calling an ancestral based diet. And it's, you know, eating more towards the way our ancestors ate say back when we were still foraging for food, you know, when we were hunters, we were gatherers. And so back in that day, that was the meat, protein, the fat, and whatever you can, um, you know, roots and tubers and berries and maybe a little honey, because those are the things that you could gather. And so back in those days, it was the pre-agricultural age. It was paleo, paleolithic is the term, ancestral whole foods diet. And so that's where everybody can easily start. And if we can just get rid of the processed food, that is a big, huge change right now, right there. Now, the only other thing there is, you know, we weren't eating wheat. And back in the paleo days, and they noticed this with bones, is there was no denture problems. The stature was, everybody was healthy when they look back at the bones. But when we get to the agricultural age, where stature drops, we have more cavities, we have more dysfunction and disease in the bones. And they can see that when we added the agricultural age in, there became more disease. And so even though a paleolithic, a paleolithic diet is good, but sometimes what's happening in our bodies is like I said earlier, that insulin resistance is turned on. Mm-hmm. And so even though paleo diet can be really good for somebody, if you've got the obesity gene, if you have the um, diabetes gene, if that's if that's part of your genetics, you can turn it off. But if it's turned on, you will just be overweight because of too many carbohydrates in the diet. And so 
paleo diet for me was too many carbohydrates. And so what I needed to do was go lower. And so for me to reset my metabolism, I had to go deeper. So I called, so the keto diet is a low carb diet, but it's more of a higher fat, moderate protein and low carbohydrates. So your carbohydrates would normally be under 50. Some people might go as low as 20. I think the induction stage for Atkins, which is a keto diet would be about 20. And so you could play around with those numbers to getting started. And so a keto diet is a, um, it, however, it's, di it's different from paleo is paleo is a lower fat, higher protein and has more starchy vegetables in it. And it might have a little bit of like, it might have a little bit of um, ancestral grains, whereas a keto diet is grain free completely and it's sugar free completely. And it's just using maybe some berries, nuts and seeds, avocados and olives. And so it is more strict in the regard that it's a higher fat, more moderate protein. And so what I've discovered being over 50 is I've kind of taken all of that information and created more of a holistic low carb method that works for women over 50 because it's going to be you not necessarily need a lot of fat, but we need the protein. So it's protein focused, as well as keeping insulin levels low. And it depends on each person personally as to what's, you know, because I run like six diagnostic labs to find hidden healing opportunities and the weight loss blocks. And when I figure out which weight loss blocks are, then we can actually fine tune the diet specifically towards your body. And so it comes down to food sensitivities. That was pivotal because once I gave up the wheat and gave up the sugar, that's when I could get my body to function. But it had to be both of them. I had to get my insulin levels low because I had insulin resistance and I had to take out the wheat because I couldn't operate with wheat in my body. I remember just eating the slices of Ezekiel in the morning one time before I went completely wheat free. You know, we all try to cut back. We try to use the, the einkorn wheat. We try to use the Ezekiel bread, but I would just get instant brain fog. Interesting. And I think yeah. that's so important to pay attention. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of people go through their day without actually being attuned to how food makes them feel. Um, right. Eating it's such an automatic behavior. They might be eating while they're watching TV or eating while they're working and they're distracted. And so they're not really paying attention to being mindful and attentive to first off, just eating in general and enjoying the food, not overeating, but then also how do these foods make me feel afterwards? Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions here. So did you find that, well, I, I, I have to give a caveat too. You can be keto and not be following like a paleo diet, if that makes sense. Right. So you can have like dirty keto. Like there was this ready whip in the fridge. We were at a family cabin oh my and gosh. it had all sorts of crap, you know, it had yeah, like dirty keto. And yes. Yeah. And so I, I wanted to highlight to people that when we're talking about a ketogenic diet, we are on the same page. This is a whole foods ketogenic diet, not the processed keto foods, because those have a lot of hidden food emulsifiers. A lot of them have artificial sweeteners. And can you kind of speak to how those affect gut health and can really block progress for weight loss or, you know, just causing inflammation, that kind of stuff? Yeah, definitely a lot of preservatives, a lot of chemicals. It's, you know, a lot of hidden carbohydrates, because, you know, at that point, you're counting net carbs, thinking that mm. the net carbs, you could eat this product because it has tapioca starch, but tapioca starch can still raise your blood sugar. Now, the, the, the caveat there is if you cannot get off of your processed foods, use them as a food bridge for the first Absolutely. Meal. You know what? Yeah. If you need to use the base culture bread, if you, I used to make my own breads. That was how I used the food bridges, but I would bake my, my own stuff at the time. I would make my own fudge. I would make what I wanted to eat because I was a baker. And so I would bake things keto and, you know, and I worked at a natural food store. So if there was something that I needed, I just, you know, I would have easy access to finding all these ingredients. And so that might've made it easier for me, but I was also, again, thinking outside the box. I mean, if I wanted to eat this, I'm going to make a keto, right. but I'm not going to stray off of the diet that I'm on. But at the same time, I would always read labels and I didn't want to eat things that had a lot of chemicals. Like, so I got down to the point where, I mean, I was re reading the labels and to this day, it's like, I can't even find a bar that I want to eat anymore. They're all full of stuff that I can't eat. Most so things, way, I'm sensitive to weight. I can't eat those. I don't want to eat all that junk. And then, you know, even the chalk zero stuff that says it's low carb is keto. That's not, not going to help you lose the weight. 
And so just eat real food. You can get cacao paste. You can mix that with coconut butter. You could spread it out on a pan and make your own chocolate. You could add whatever sweetener you want to it. And so it becomes a cleaner version of things that you could eat keto. So it's not that cocoa is bad for you. It's what they put in it. And so if you're buying all your stuff from the store and it's full of chemicals, I mean, when I run food sensitivity test, it has a chemical. It tests foods and chemicals. And you could see the chemicals that people are reacting to, the betaine, I mean, the um, the benzoic acid in Diet Coke, all of the aspirin, salicylic acid. Um, there's so many chemicals. Food coloring comes up all the time from the processed foods. And so you want your food to be as clean as possible. And I think that's why people stall out when they're on keto. Now they start and yes. they lose a little yeah. bit of weight and then they're eating a processed food. They're keeping in processed food as opposed to, they're not focused on protein. They're not focused on good fat. And so since I had had depression, my big focus was I needed fat and I did very good on fat. So Bulletproof Coffee was huge for me. Full fat coconut milk was huge for me. I needed the fats. And to this day, I still need the fats. But I also, to this day, make sure I get the right amount of protein. And so you want to, you know, want to focus on good fats and protein. And the processed food is a dessert. If you're going to have a processed food, it's not the meal. It's the yeah. dessert. Yeah, and it's, I think, that, like mm -hmm. you said, it can be a bridge. Like, I think there's the good, better, best. But eventually, right. we have to stop using those protein bars. Exactly. Stuff because <laughs> yeah, you can have a piece of steak. And the piece of steak comes with no additives, no chemicals, right. no food emulsifiers. It's easily digestible, easily absorbed. Like, that is powerhouse food. Or you can get 20 grams of protein from a bar that has um, artificial sweeteners that are or natural sweeteners, but either are probably going to want to increase your cravings for sweets in general mm -hmm. and it, um, with food emulsifiers that will cause gut inflammation and reduce the absorption of the protein. And so we really have to look at the whole food matrix. And I think right. the longer I'm in this, the more I'm an advocate of whole real food, just like you are. And also I think getting very just clear with people that the more insulin resistant you are, the more carb resistant you are. Like exactly. The more insulin resistant you are, the, the lower the carbohydrate level will probably have to be for your lifestyle. And I wanted to get some clarity around there. A couple questions. Like I said, we're pulling back the hood. So did you ever track your macronutrients? You know, I wasn't a good tracker like with apps. What I would do was I would just have a piece of paper. And so what was really powerful for me was just to make sure that my carbs were low. And I think I just read labels and I would just write things down like a journal. So I would keep that on the countertop and tell myself what I was doing for that day, which was really powerful because to keep your brain from panicking, you need to let your brain know what you're doing because it, you know, it's like a Labrador. And if you don't, you know, keep it under control and and and, and keep it calm, it's going to, it's going to panic. And so that was one thing because I would follow Dave Asprey. And so he was the person that I was inspired by because he had been 20, 30, 300 pounds and vegetable, you know, eating a vegetarian diet and exercising 360 days a year. He never lost any weight. And so when he pulled in the Bulletproof diet and um, learned how to lose the weight, that is exactly what helped me because I had the same obesogenic um, body type. And so you taking out the carbs were essential to get your body to reduce metabolism. So when you reduce the metabolism or support your metabolism, reduce the blood sugar, then you turn your, your fat burning process on. And that's how you reset your metabolism from the hormonal prospect. And so that's that's the power right there. If you use the fat and the protein, I mean, I just had a client re just go through six months with my program, 300 points improvement on her metabolic analysis, 95% less pain, 20, she's 26 pounds down and she's, you know, she's reset her metabolism, reset her blood sugar levels. And now she can actually tune into losing more weight. And to really fine tune and her energy increases all the time. She's like, wow, I've got more energy this week. And so it's just amazing what we can do when we reset our metabolism. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of mindset blocks that people may be experiencing. Mm -hmm. People might be sitting there or they're walking their dog or they're driving their, in their car and like, oh my gosh, she's telling me that I have to give up my carbs. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to have sugar again. Oh my gosh. Like, and they, they go to that almost mm -hmm. like the catastrophizing mindset. So mm -hmm. They're looking at what they have to give up. And my question is, well, aren't you giving up more if you don't give up the foods that are making you sick? Like, what right. are you giving up if you're sick all the time? You're giving up your energy. You're giving up your time. You're giving up your productivity. You're giving up your health. 
I mean, man, you're giving up a lot more by holding on to these foods that are making me sick than you are by releasing them and just like letting those foods go. And so you know, that's why, yeah, you get a cookbook and you got to get excited about recipes. So like, what do you want to eat? What can you get excited about? And what can you create in your kitchen? And if you don't have time to create what's in your kitchen, use the food bridges and buy, you know, keto bread that doesn't have any wheat gluten, no wheat gluten, because as long as you keep wheat in your diet, you will stay stuck and you will have gut dysfunction and you will have depression because wheat causes all of those problems. And so wheat has to completely go out of the diet. And so that one is really something people think they could eat those low carb breads with the wheat in it, but don't do that because that's going to sabotage your, your success. And just additives in general. Like there's so many keto breads out there that have so many additives, chemicals, um, like I said, food emulsifiers. And it's just like, ugh, no. Like we were at the lake, like I said, a cabin and there was this keto bread and <laughs> okay. And then the next time I'm just like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So I just, you know, did um, like a pickle and a pepper spear and some tomato and some cheese. I, I do dairy and I wrapped it in some meat and I'm like, Perfect. Yeah. So much more satisfying. And I didn't want more. Like the thing that I notice is when I have the processed health foods, they're not as satisfying and they always activate my hunger for yes. more. And they Thank leave you. the overeating, like mm -hmm. me at least. And was that your experience if you use them as a bridge too? Definitely. They do increase your appetite. And I think that was why our what helped me lose the last 20 pounds was I really ditched all the food bridges. I stopped the protein powders. I stopped the food bars. I went straight down to just eating real food. And so I would focus more on protein, actually satiating my appetite. And I would only eat one to two big meals a day and I wouldn't need any more than that. And so combining that with circadian rhythm and getting out and getting sunlight and keeping my body activated. So that at that point I was activating fat loss at the same time. I was reducing all processed food, focusing more on a good protein and getting that sunlight to activate my body's fat burning process was huge. I dropped 20 pounds just doing that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's incredible. And you mentioned fasting, we're going to get there, but did you measure? So first off, I have to point out, it is possible to lose a lot of weight without tracking your macronutrients. Yes. Yes, I'm not a tracker. <laughs> like I'm a huge advocate. Like if you want to track, that's fantastic. I go hot and cold with it. Um, I find it's a lot easier to track if you're eating whole foods and it's a lot easier to track if you're not snacking all day, but it's also possible just make a food plan for the day yeah, at the beginning it. of the day or the night before and then assess how you did. Because I always say like, I can look at your macros and I can see what you ate, but what I can't see is what did you plan to eat? Mm -hmm. And how were your food choices impacted by your circumstances? Like, are you driving the show or are the circumstances driving the show? Because that matters a lot when we're talking about food control. Yeah, right. I'm always looking in advance to see what I'm going to eat. And I mm -hmm. think the biggest thing I did was I just made sure that I had fat, that I was eating protein. And I think basically I just made sure I kept my carbs under 50 for the most part. And, you know, what I track today is I make sure that I've got salt and potassium is that's what I track. I track my minerals. And then right now what I'm doing is I make sure I don't eat anything unless I know it's medicine for my body. Basically, it's just like, that's kind of where I'm at now. But you know, I'm not starting. I'm already eight years into this. And so I'm looking at is my protein going to equal 30 grams or more. So I'm looking to get 30 to 50 grams of protein to turn off my appetite so I don't have any cravings for I can build muscle. And so being a woman at 61, over 50, you want to focus on building muscle and making sure you have bone mass. We don't want scarcopenia. And so this is not about just losing weight. This is about getting stronger. And so we want to lose the fat, but we don't, but we want to build muscle. And so the scale may not move as quickly because you're going to be building muscle as you lose the fat. And that's what we want. That's what's wrong with Ozempic and all the other processes and the low carb diary, diary, diets. You lose fat, but you're also losing your bone mass and you're losing your muscles. And so this is a more where you focus on more protein, build the muscle. As you build a muscle, you eventually could get to the point where you're in maintenance and you could tolerate more carbohydrates. And so then that makes it easier to be active and stay active. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. A couple more questions. Did you ever measure your ketone levels? I did. I had a um, keto mojo for a while. Yeah. 
So that was the one thing I did do with tracking because, you know, I'm kind of a nerd and a geek at that point. I have an R ring. I like to track my heart rate and I did track my ketone levels, but I don't track it anymore because it got to a point where it was always just like 0.5 or something. I took a blood test last November and it showed I had cake down ketone traces of ketones so i have it in my body and i could tell when i'm in ketosis like i'm in ketosis right now because all i did was have some bulletproof coffee i've had lion's mane i've had some um i'm focused on things that help me create bdnf so my brain can focus and so when i'm when i'm turned on like this this is this is ketosis this is activating your brain and when your brain is on fire and your energy levels are good that's ketosis but when you're feeling tired and sluggish, like after a meal, then, then you know that your ketone yeah. levels have dropped, right? Okay, so I think right now I'm probably at 0.5 because yeah. I, what did I do? I fasted this morning. I had some half and half. That's just like the last domino to fall. I always say it's a half and half for my coffee. Um, and then for lunch, I had my homemade yogurt. So you're a fan of Dr. Davis. So I make a CEO yes. yogurt. And then um, I did like a half a can of... This wild avocado tuna and so, oh, so delicious. cool, so nice. delicious. And I put like a tablespoon of pesto in there, Ooh. and that was a really nice combination. So all in all, it was like seven grams of net carbs from the dairy, like forty-one grams of protein, and then a ton of fat. And Perfect. before that, I was at like 0.4. So I think I'm about about 0.5 right now. And and they technically say ketosis is about 0.5. And mm -hmm. where I'm at right now, I like to mix it up and change it up. But I'm not doing like any long distance running or anything like that. And so I feel so good when I can be in this kind of low state of ketosis. I just. Yeah. Feel and you ate all the food that made you feel good and that you wanted to eat. You didn't mm. feel deprived at all. And so that's how we want to look at food is what can we eat that we like that's going to nourish our body? Because we want to look at food that is as medicine for our body, food that's going to activate our metabolism, that's going to help us lose weight. And we feel really good. So it doesn't feel like deprivation. It's just opportunity. No. It feels amazing. Like what I don't like is how I feel after I eat sugar. Like I, it's getting easier and easier for me. And I've been doing this about five years. So it's easier and easier every single time I'm around sugar to say no, because I don't like that feeling of being foggy or like bogged down after I eat sugar. I'm not old enough yet to where I'm feeling it in my joints or anything like that, but I feel mentally bogged down and I don't like it. And it affects my sleep. Yeah, so that's what I noticed with one of my clients that she had lost 50 pounds and um, she had had knee pain. So mm -hmm. she dropped the 50 pounds and knee pain went away. She healed her joints because she had come with me to down the Grand Canyon and she had excruciating knee pain, just oh, like oh. I did back in the day. And um, so she, you know, She's hanging out with me. We're doing bulletproof coffee. She's learning the techniques. She's doing it. And then um, she drops 50 pounds and all her knee pain went away. But this is what's really fascinating because she had eaten so much bread to the point where like, oh, my God, I don't I, you just eat bread all the time. You can't just eat bread. Yeah. And so anyway, if she eats bread to this day, immediate arthritis comes back. Mm hmm. And so yep. now she can hear, she took all the noise out. She can hear what's happening. And then she'll even notice it with, she, you know, she works in a candy store. She eats a little bit of candy to try it out. And then um, she'll notice that the inflammation comes back. And so immediately the arthritis will start to come back. And so that's information to your body. And why would you want, you know, then at that point, you know, I don't want to eat that. Yep. And that's where you want to get to get to the point where you can hear what's happening in your body, make the changes, look at it as an opportunity, stay excited, figure out what's the next step. It's there's always a next step. What can you get? What can you do next? That's going to help you move. If you get stuck, you know, follow people who are doing it follow people who are open minded and are excited about making changes. And then you will too, because when we hang out with like minded people, we get that information into our brain and we activate it and it works for us as well. Yep. I love it. Okay. I have a couple mm -hmm. more questions. Um, I wrote down, oh, yeah, I wrote down a note and I couldn't read my own handwriting. <laughs> um, yeah. So calories. So I know from my, my personal experience, I was at a bateau and it's like, I'm at a healthy weight. I'm at my ideal weight, but I love experimenting. But like, can I push it even more? Like, what if someone wants to lose the last five pounds? What, what can I optimize here? And so for me, what I realized was I was eating healthy, very, mm -hmm. very, very clean. 
but I was still eating more calories than what I needed to be at that certain weight. Did you ever experience that in your journey where it's like, all right, I'm eating the right foods, but maybe just like larger portions of nuts or fats than yeah, what I need? Definitely. It would be the nuts that start to drive it all up. And yeah. of course, if you start bringing in the keto cookies, I'm a baker. I baked keto cookies. My boyfriend right? likes keto yes. cookies. And so, but I'm sensitive to butter. And so I was sensitive to cocoa. So that's a double hit on me if I eat the keto cookies. And so yeah. my body is still sensitive to the sensitivities that I had. And so I'm usually aware of that. So if I eat those, I might get inflammation. It's going to keep me overweight. So if you're eating foods you're sensitive to, that's going to keep you having water weight and it may keep you from losing the weight. So when, you know, you may not know what your food sensitivities are. So if you feel stuck and bloated, that could be a process. But also, you know, the high calorie foods that we're snacking on because we're just bored and hungry, but like the taste of it, that will make a difference. And even if you're eating three meals a day, and maybe it's, um, it could be too much food for your body. But so then digestion is slower. So like if you eat later in the day, I think that's the biggest problem. I've noticed that if I cut my food off earlier, I always keep my weight down. But if I eat anytime after six, seven, eight o'clock, I will just gain weight because what happens in the evening is your digestion turns off. We are not meant to eat after dark. If you follow your circadian rhythm, we stop eating when, after dark because this digestion, first of all, will stall. You'll have more symptoms of GERD. Saliva stops. We stop digesting. So we're supposed to actually get ready for sleep, but you've got your digestion turned on because you're eating at 10, 11 o'clock at night. That means you're going to raise your cortisol levels, you're raising your insulin levels, and you're not digesting your food. So you can't burn any fat. And that could stall people out right there is eating at the wrong times of the day. And so it could be that what is the best time of day for you to eat? And it may not be three meals a day. Initially, start with three meals a day. Don't let yourself be hungry. Eat the fat and protein, get off the processed food. Right. And then what you want to do is just fine tune it. If you're full, if you eat 30 to 50 grams of protein and get your fat in there, you're not going to be hungry for six hours. Yeah. And so if you're hungry all the time, it means you're not prioritizing the protein and the fat. And so what I like to tell my clients is eat everything you want to eat at your meal. Turn your insulin levels on right at that moment. Have your snack with your meal yep. and then begin eating until your dinner. And so if you're just eating those two meals a day, your body's going to burn fat in between that time. And so that's kind of how I look at it. I just make, and there's days where I'll open up my eating window and I'll just eat for two to three hours straight. And then I just cut it off. And okay. so that's because i still have food sensitivities or I actually have like, I don't have an off switch. I have foods, I food addiction issues. And so even if I eat blueberries, that turns on my sugar switch, my food's in, and I want to eat more. I've had trouble with keto granola, although I've gotten a better handle on that lately too. But if I eat something that tastes really good, that kind of has a little bit of sweetness. And if I eat too many blueberries, it, the very next day I'm eating more blueberries. And yeah. so that's what throws me off. If I hit, if I eat too much fruit, even, even pomegranates at this point, that's still too much sugar from my blood. And so you want to listen to your body and find out what it is that you could eat. I could eat some blackberries or raspberries. Those are better for me than blueberries because they're lower sugar. And I, and blueberries is a food sensitivity. I've never gotten over that one. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think that, uh, I don't know. It's just like paying attention. And I love fasting for that reason, because yeah. it's almost like a reset, a mental reset around your relationship with food. And it helps to resensitize you to what foods you're actually creating. And it helps, at least for me, to really resensitize me to just like appropriate portions. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so many things. Just also what foods make me want to eat more of them. And then that, tr that cues me into where I really need to be cautious around those proactive boundaries. So like nuts for me, like I could mm -hmm. just eat nuts all the time. And so if I pre-portion the nuts in a, you know, quarter cup or whatever I want, and I have that, and then I know that's done. That helps me so much versus like just kind of having the, the nuts out along with that, like a bowl of nuts and right. just kind of grazing on them throughout the day. I think that can really. So right. you have to do the servings when it comes to nuts. And, if, and, and like you said, you know, I mean, I just write things down. If I like if my weight is stalled, if I want to lose a little bit of weight, what can I do? Like what I'm doing right now is I popped up a little bit. Because I've been trying to, you know, play with fiber. How much fiber does my body need? I'm Should I ask you that? Yeah. I'm doing the coconut. I was doing the coconut milk yogurt, SIBO yogurt, but I feel like I keep gaining weight when I do that. So I'm backing down on the fiber and I'm just kind of 
basically going back to fat and protein and trying to add in some vegetables for my fiber versus maybe flax and chia just to see what yeah. my body wants to do. And so I'm just kind of fine tuning it. And, and maybe, you know, yesterday, yesterday I stopped eating at um, 2.30. So I ate early and then I finished by 2.30 and my weight was down two pounds. And so that's how I keep the balance is like, if your weight's popping up, it's really easy to pull it back down. Just pay attention to what you're doing. Write it all down. If you need to just make a plan. If you make a plan and tell your brain, this is what you're going to do. If you want to fast and you're going to eat at 11, tell your body we're, we're fine. We're not starving. We're going to eat at 11 o'clock. If you do that trick, it really works. It does. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think Having a backup plan helps me too. So like yeah. if you're going to plan to fast, especially if it's a longer one, like, okay, I'm going to try to make it till dinner tonight. And then for whatever reason, like you're hungry or you just it's just not going to happen. Having a backup meal or like, okay, if I'm going to break the fast early, this is what I'm going to have. I'm going to have a right. hard egg and a quarter cup of nuts. Perfect. Or have a I think that having a little bit of a plan be your backup plan so that you don't feel like you're a failure if you don't make it, you know, for a 22 or a 24 hour fast, especially just starting out or like bone broth. I really like bone, bone broth, broth mm -hmm. during my fasting. Oh, wait, so one, one, of, one of the things that I always did was the bulletproof coffee because being a, um, having had depression, the fat really worked for me. So what it does is it helps me increase my ketones. It helps my brain feel better. I don't feel tired. So I could push through it fast. I would just do that two or three times a day. And so I would call it a fat fast. Okay, yeah. And so when okay. I did a fat fast, I would always accelerate my ketones and it's not enough food to break your fast. And so, you know, you, you can have collagen even or bone broth. And so you want to just strategically be drinking things throughout the day and all of a sudden, and you've already done a 24 to 36 hour fast and you've got some weight loss. And so if you do that once a week, it's it's really not as hard as you would think it is once you get your body to be more activated towards being a fat burner. Exactly. Yeah. Once you can like, and I think that that's the benefit of kind of easing into things, maybe like going a little bit paleo, then dipping into keto. Yes. Experimenting with intermittent fasting, because if you try to just jump into keto or jump into intermittent fasting and your body is still just purely a sugar burner and it has a hard time activating those fat burning enzymes, it's going to be very uncomfortable. And I think that that's where this mindset piece around like slow, sustainable changes, um, one step at a time in the right direction, ideally, um, I think all of that can play in. But I do have one more question for you mm -hmm. before we wrap it up. So it sounds like normally you delay breakfast. Is that correct? I used to delay breakfast. I used to follow the program where I would not eat to like 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. Or, I, you know, if my stress levels are okay and I can do that, I would do that. But lately, I haven't wanted to. I'm like ready to eat breakfast at 9 or 10 and I'd rather be done eating by 3 or 4. Awesome. And so if I'll do one big meal a day and I'm talking, if I'm doing eggs, it's going to be four or five eggs with bacon. And I might eat all, all of the apple cakes got like eight pieces of bacon in there. I might eat four or I might eat all eight, but you know, so if I'm eating more bacon or chicken sausage or something, I'm going to cut the eggs down. But if I'm just eating eggs and I'm hungry, that's five eggs. That's how much protein we need to have. 30 grams of protein is five eggs. And so you want to do is, you know, calculate six grams of protein per that egg and then add in some meat and then you don't know, delete an egg. And so that's kind of how I look at it is it has to be 30, 30 grams of protein. So I just want to turn off my appetite. And so if I eat one big meal at breakfast, then I'm eating a lighter meal later. And so then I don't need anything heavy later in the day. But my my go-to um, food for fasting as well is if I'm trying to fast and I don't want to eat later, but I'm hungry, I'm to the point where, well, you know, you need to build muscle. So let's just have a can of sardines. Let's just have a can of tuna or put some arugula with it. Just have a lighter meal at the end of the day. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, I'm good. You know, I'm just going to feed my brain what it needs. And I'm not going to worry too much about that fast. If, if that's the day where I'm overstressed and I don't want to deal with it. That's what I did last night. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I was good. I was fasting because we came back from vacation. I was like, I always love a fast to reset after vacation. I'm just going to have my yogurt at night. Um, and I love it with the, um, I do two tablespoons of collagen um, and then berries from the garden, whatever's ready. And, but then I'm like, that's not going to do it. That's just not going to say she needed. <laughs> and so I had, I opened up a can of tuna. I'm like, okay, let's not overeat here. Like how many grams of protein do you really need? to get to that 30 to 40 gram threshold. So I was proud because I cut the tuna in half, but then I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel like such a cat right now. Like I feel like <laughs> I eat like a cat, like let me get my bowl of tuna out. But I think that that plays into the mental attitude that we have about food. The right. Well, the, the thing is, 
that the we body have. wants protein. Yeah. It's telling you, you haven't eaten enough protein yet. Yeah. Let's eat more food until you actually hit that protein threshold. And when you hit the protein threshold, 30 to 50 grams of protein, your body's like, oh, we're done. We're fine. Yeah. But, but if you're eating eat processed that. food, yeah, processed food, happen. the appetite doesn't turn off because you never gave your body protein. So yeah. if you keep eating fat free and, and low protein products, and you got to remember too, like egg white, if you're eating egg whites only and you're not getting egg yolk, you're only absorbing 18% of that protein. And mm. then the thing with plant based proteins, it's still, again, only about 18% of that protein is getting digestible and it's not 100% digestible, but you're not getting the full amount of protein. And so there, you know, sometimes if my protein is short, I'll just do, I have a really quick. So if people stayed on this long listening to us, here's yeah. the hat. So perfect aminos, one serving of perfect aminos is 30 grams of protein. If you're fasting and you're not eating and you need amino acids for your brain, like I am very deficient in my neurotransmitters, my hor all my hormones have been tanked. I need amino acids, just like my mom told me when I was a kid. And so if you get 30 grams of perfect aminos. And if you add that to your day or especially to a fasting, you'll be able to go longer fasting. But the hack there too, is if you just don't feel like eating that much and your protein didn't hit 30 grams of protein, I add in a couple of pills. I add a couple of those protein because my goal is to gain muscle and I am gaining muscle at 61 years old. And this is my hack. If you focus on protein, you will get that weight loss. You will get that muscle to grow so that you don't have to worry about your carbohydrates when you're in maintenance. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's the hack. That's what it really works for me. And I, I, I'm really gaining muscle. It's really exciting. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I like to say if you're trying to lose weight, yes, you want an energy deficit. We don't want a protein deficit. Correct. So we, we don't want an amino acid deficit. So my question there was when I asked about the, the timing are you working out and timing your protein around your strength training? Not specifically. I have a hard time actually scheduling in my training. So today I just fasted and had collagen twice, but I did do my strength training during that fasted period. I did arm work. I yeah. did. I like if I'm blending my bulletproof coffee, I'll get down and do 20 squats. And so I'll do 20 squats while my, my coffee's blending because that's the habit that I built. And then I did, you know, I don't do a lot of push-ups, but I did five assisted push-ups on the ground. I still need to get stronger. So I'm just making sure I get movement throughout the day as much as I can. And, and then if I don't feel like I had enough protein or if I ate earlier in the day, I will have a serving of perfect aminos in the evening because that will give me that extra muscle building action because I'll be in muscle synthesis. And the more our body is producing muscles, the faster your metabolism, you're going to build a better metabolism. The problem is if you've got a low basal metabolic rate, it's because your muscles are too low. And so if you build muscle, you've got a stronger basal metabolic rate, you could burn more calories. And that's what our body wants to do. We want to take that protein and build muscle. So we have that better basal metabolic rate. That's yeah. the power that we have. And I want to highlight, this is the right way to do things, guys. Like, obviously, you know, like we both have done our research, like mm -hmm. independently, and we have landed on the same conclusions. This is the right way. I was talking to someone um, recently who had lap band surgery several years ago mm. at his weight. And what that did unknowingly, because she didn't get any education about things, was reduced her appetite, her ability to eat, and that compromised her bone health. So she didn't get enough protein for years and years and years. And yeah. um, whatever she ate had, you know, poor absorption because of the surgery. And um, now she has osteopenia, osteoporosis, and she's dealing with that. And she's like, had I known better, I would have done better. But nobody told me. So we're telling you, you need your protein. <laughs> Please eat your protein. Um, all right. Last, I keep lying to you, but, you know, this is fun. So last question. What do you put in your bulletproof, co bulletproof coffee? Well, you um, today I put in my grass-fed collagen. I put in creatine. I had two servings because I was not going to have breakfast. So I wanted to be able to just kind of amp up ketones. And so my second one, I put in um, cocoa. I put in vanilla. I put in some salt. I put in more collagen. I only do one serving of creatine a day, but I went in the first cup. And then I put in a couple of drops. When I use cocoa, I put in a couple of drops of a of the now monk fruit just mm -hmm. to kind of taste, take off a little bit of the bitterness. And... Um, 
I think that was what I put in my bulletproof coffee. Oh, ghee, ghee and MCT oil. So I put a tablespoon of ghee and a tablespoon of MCT oil. So I'm a fat burner. I can use that much fat. I can have fat all day long and I'll be fine. But if you're first starting out with MCT oil, start off with a teaspoon or even a half teaspoon to see how your body manages that fat because it's a very fast acting ketone producing fat. And if your liver is fatty and like in the beginning, when you start a low carb diet, a keto diet, your liver is fatty. You have fatty liver. It's very rampant out there. So if we're overweight, we have fatty liver as well. And so we need to get the liver to be healthy. And so that's what we are doing when you are actually losing weight. You are resetting your liver. You are resetting your gut. You are resetting your whole metabolism. And so you have to burn through all the stored fat in your body. And so that's why if you get to a plateau, that's okay. Your body's working behind the scenes it's it's getting cardio metabolic actions happening you're, you're burning up all that stored fat you're getting rid of it you're actually turning yourself into a fat burning machine but your body has to go after all of that stored fat that has been shoving in storage and so when you're when you have sugar in your blood even if it's just a protein shake or it's just fruit if you have sugar in your blood, you're a sugar burner, your body will burn that sugar first, it will store all the excess before it will help you burn your fat. And so if you want to burn the fat, you need to just flip that sugar switch off, flip on your fat burning process and just increase the protein. If you increase the protein, you're increasing neurotransmitters. That's the other thing. And that's one of the reasons why people get depressed with the Ozempic is because they don't get protein. You're not yeah. getting the neurotransmitters. You need to add in that protein. We are meat beans. We are meant to eat the meat. If we do not add that into our body, we will fall apart. I've never had hair loss. And I lost most of my weight in my 50s. And my hair is thicker now than it's ever been. I'm actually letting it grow out, which is completely for somebody who's a toehead as a child. I always had thin hair. I don't have thick hair, but it's thicker now than it's ever been. And so I'm like, wow, I'm 61. So like there's there's no disease in my body and I'm on no medication. I heard somebody say, oh, you can't solve everything um, without a medication. I'm like, I'm don't have any medications if you use the right supplementation for practitioner grade supplementations because food is devoid of nutrients and meat is a nutrient and your plants are kind of like the medicine and so plant medicine depending on what your body needs and how your body reacts to different foods then you can customize what you need and that's what I do with my clients I customize their food based on the food sensitivity tests and all the labs that are going to find your hidden healing opportunities so you could dial all that in collapse the time it takes to get healthy and start living life as an adventure and just really just keep excited. That's the thing that I've noticed lately that if you just get excited about it and look at everything as an opportunity and just keep in action, like you said, you know, even though we're worried, we're overwhelmed, we're a little bit of fear, follow people like you and me who are doing it and yeah. having success. And then that way you will as too. I mean, I make so many reels out there. It all comes from my heart. I just put out a new reel on Instagram and it was on the success that my client have. And she just did, like I said, she did her second metabolic reset test and 300 points down. She's reset her metabolism, blood sugars under control. She went from fives down to twos and ones and she's turned off all the pain in her body. And she was using a scooter in the house. Wow. She could not walk. She had to sit, lay down after every meal. She had to lay down after work. She couldn't, ha she had no energy. She was slowly dying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the studies are showing if you get yourself on a paleolithic diet, on a ketogenic diet or a low carb method, reduce the sugar load on your body. And that's the carbohydrate load on your body. Then you can get 10 to 20 more years of quality life and you don't have to have medications. Yep. You can use supplements strategically. And I always pull that into my programs and I use them myself because I want my body to function. I want my hormones to function at 61. So I have to, I have to support them. Yeah. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. I love just kind of the back and forth of real life experience and examples. Mm -hmm. And um, if people want to work with you or learn more about you, how can they, how can they connect with you? Yeah, I am at lauribaloo.com and you could download my workbook there. When you look around, I've got my testimonial page there. You can see what some of my clients are, are there, how they're doing. And then I'm also on Instagram at Lori Ballou Weight Loss. And I have my YouTube station and I put a lot of good videos out there on how you can make low carb work for you. But basically hanging out with somebody who is doing this in her 50s is going to be the power that you need. I am very inspirational. I'm a very motivational speaker. I am out here to empower women. I want all women to know that they can make the changes that they that 
They can make any change and it's going to start giving them results and just build on top of those changes. Don't assume that you can't do it. Don't ever assume that you have to get on a medication. If your doctors are dismissing you and telling you that your labs are normal, but you're overweight and they're telling you you have pre you might be pre-diabetic, don't accept that. Find out what you can do to reverse it. Pre-diabetes is reversible. And that is pre-diabetes is your insulin levels turned on. It's your sugar switch turned on. Turn off your sugar switch. This is called practicing epigenetics. I love it. You can turn all the pain in your body off because it's inflammation. When you reduce the sugar load on your body, you reduce the inflammation and you get healthier. And so a lot of my videos on my YouTube station are talking about how this process works. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. This has been great. Um, I really appreciate your time. I, I appreciate your experience, your expertise. Um, I really hope people found this one helpful. And I hope if you haven't already followed this podcast or subscribed on YouTube, please do that right now to show your support. Um, leave a comment. Let us know if you enjoyed this or if you have any follow-up questions and share it with a friend. All right. Thank you, Lori. You're welcome. Thank you so much for letting me come on and spread the message.